What's up everybody, I am John from Aguinis Games and welcome to my Metal Gear Solid, or at least Why I Love Metal Gear Solid podcast. Now much like my Why I Love Resident Evil podcast, this probably won't get many views, but it's a great way of getting off my chest why I love these, you know, these game series and, and these games in particular. So let's get started. Um, first I'm going to say that Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2, Solid Snake, I haven't really played through those, you know, they kind of pass me by. Um, it's not that they're old and 2D and all that stuff. I love playing retro 2D games, you know, side scrollers and things like that, platformers. But um, I only got to kind of play the games when um, Metal Gear 3 Subsistence came out and, and had them kind of added to the extras menu. You know, they didn't come out over in the UK um, ever, as far as I can remember when I was a kid because I never saw them. It's probably a game that I would have picked up as well, so... Um, I have no real attachment to them. That's the only problem. I've tried to play through them, and I think it's just a generational thing. I, you know, I grew up with Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation, and to play them in this kind of 2D top-down format, uh, just, I don't know, I can't really bring myself to play them. But maybe one day I'll, you know, I'll jump on them and finish them. But what I want to talk about is the Metal Gear Solid series, and why it means so much to me. So let's start with the first game. Metal Gear Solid. Released for the PlayStation in, I believe, 1998. I think that's when a lot of um, great games were getting released. I think Resident Evil 2 had got released. Uh, one of the Tomb Raiders. You know, probably a Crash Bandicoot, maybe the second one. It was a long time ago, so it's, you know my memory's a bit vague when it comes to what games were actually released. But Metal Gear Solid was one of those games, and my god, did it blow me away, as well as a lot of other gamers. Um, it was this tactical espionage action adventure that had you sneaking around as main protagonist Solid Snake. Now, when I first played this game, I'd never played anything like this. You've got to remember that, you know, I'd only been playing kind of platformers and kind of kiddie games up until that, or just shoot 'em ups. Um, playing Metal Gear Solid was like the first time I played Resident Evil or Tomb Raider 2. Um, it was something fresh, unique, and different. And learning to have to be kind of stealthy you know, and wait around corners for guards to come by and then either choke them out, you know, break their necks or just evade them completely was um, something that I had to get to grips with. It's almost like when I started to learn how to play Bloodborne or, you know, I, I started to learn how to play like Dead Rising, games like that. It was quite a tough game if you didn't know how the game played and not a lot of people did at that point. You had to learn how to be stealthy and not alert every guard that you kind of came across, you know, to your, to your presence. So that was great. Now, Metal Gear Solid, as we all know, is known for its story and that's one of the major things that brought me back to Metal Gear Solid, kept me playing that game even after I finished it, you know, one or two times. Um, the first game still has a goofy story, much like the rest of the series. If you go back and play it, it's, it's still pretty goofy, but it's not as over the top as the rest of the other Metal Gear Solid games um, or Metal Gear Solid's overall kind of plot. But yeah, it was great. There's a lot of uh, twists in it. Finding out that, spoiler alert, if you haven't played a game that's like, you know, 20 to 28 years old now, um, the big twist of the game for me was when you find out that McDonald Miller is actually your twin brother, Liquid Snake, in disguise. And he kind of reveals himself by taking off, you know, McDonald Miller's sunglasses and untying his hair. And you see his long hair and realize, oh my god, that's that's Liquid Snake. At that age, I think age does have something to do with it. Um, I wasn't used to, you know, plot twists like that, like a lot of other kind of... Uh, young adults, I should say. Whereas now being older, I can see a plot twist a mile off, you know, I see it coming, but back then, you know, being kind of impressionable, um, yeah, I, I didn't see it coming, and it was a great moment, shocking moment. Um, it made Liquid Snake even that more, like, kind of evil and dastardly. You see, I think the original Metal Gear Solid has an edge over the other Metal Gear Solid games because it has its own confined, condensed story within its own, you know, world basically Metal Gear Solid is is a different beast compared to its its predecessors and uh, and its forebearers as well um, you don't need to know what happened and you don't really need to, to see what's coming whereas its sequels kind of relied on people knowing what was going on and it borrowed from from Metal Gear Solid and, and previous games in the series like Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 um, to build its narratives with Metal Gear Solid it's its own thing literally it's almost standalone uh, in my opinion Anyway, now, not only that, but the game had a great a great soundtrack, fantastic soundtrack that, uh, you know, just added to all the cinematic moments and, and stuff like that. You know, did a great job. 
Uh, gameplay wise, I'd say the game now, if you go back and play it, of course it's going to be a bit kind of clunky and uh, a little bit kind of old school. But for the time, you know, that whole kind of semi top down view, um, just kind of hitting a wall and snake lays against the wall and you can see what's around the corner um, was great, like for the time. And it's been used ever since in tons of games, you know, wall hugging is now a thing. Um, but not only that, you could also just punch guards knock them out or you could grab them with the square button and choke them out or break the neck it was up to you. you you actually had the option to you know not kill like um soldiers and stuff like that the only thing i think the game kind of flopped at was the whole running and shooting um control scheme you have to hold down x but x is also used to duck so what ends up happening is sometimes you'll hold down x and snake will duck and then you have to press x again for him to get up and that's when you hold x and then you can run around and shoot, you know, by tapping square. But it's a bit of a, a fumble, you know, and it was, um, obviously it was corrected for future releases, future games, future Metal Gear games. Now, one of the best things, one of my favorite things about Metal Gear Solid was the variety of weapons you could obtain. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the game's, like, worst elements, and that's backtracking back to this armory in order to pick up weapons. That kind of sucks, but... It's not like a, a massive issue, to be honest, because the game's so short. So a little bit of backtracking keeps the game, you know, going a bit longer. It's not that big of a, a deal, but it does get annoying when you're kind of halfway through the game. You're all the way past this certain segment of the game, and then you have to kind of run all the way back to get a sniper rifle and stuff like that. However, saying that, um, you could get suppressors for your pistol, you could get sniper rifles... Uh, a Nikita missile launcher which had like guided missiles that you could guide around the place um, and also zoom into first person so that you could you know see the like terror on a god well you couldn't because they all wore, wore balaclavas but you could see that the god was like shitting himself as this missile came towards him uh, things like that on top of that you also had like the health replenishers which was uh, rations um, diazepam which could steady your aim when using the sniper rifle um, all these extra kind of key cards that you picked up would open, you know, various doors. And I would say the game had a slightly Metroidvania sort of vibe to it because you could, you know, come up against a door that you couldn't unlock earlier in the game and then once you got, like, key card level 6, you could go back and, and you know, claim basically the items from that room that you couldn't open before. Um, it kept the player kind of wanting to play on more and go back to these areas so they could pick up some, some useful items and some... Uh, some extra bits and pieces as well as some new weapons etc etc overall metal gear solid is an amazing achievement of a game um the story kept me coming back time and time again now i haven't touched upon the bosses now the bosses were a staple of metal gear solid as well as the future games in the series and some of the boss battles were really really good like you could fight um revolver ocelot uh amongst kind of all these 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 trip wires that were attached to c4 and stuff and you had to protect this um this character the president of arms tech uh, president baker and so you couldn't run into the wires otherwise the whole place would go up um so you have to have like a one-on-one -on -one standoff with revolver ocelot kind of like a wild west shootout and that was revolver ocelot's whole stick you know that he was like a gunslinger um boss fight was amazing then you had the tank boss battle uh, where you had to chuck like chaff grenades you know so that it would scramble the tank and then throw like a grenade into the the open hatch of the tank to blow it up a uh, vulcan raven you know making sure that he didn't see see you he had this huge wide uh, cone of vision and if he saw you well he'd let rip with his vulcan cannon and you'd get fucked up pretty quickly um instead you had to play a little bit of hide and seek with him and then once his back was to you you could fire a nikita missile straight into him yeah, all the boss battles were amazing, but none were better than Metal Gear Rex. That was a standout boss battle. When you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Metal Gear Rex, it was amazing to see that thing moving and coming after you. Very scary. Now, something else I haven't mentioned is the voice acting. Spot on. The voice acting was some of the best seen in a video game up until that point. I don't think any other video game in the 90s came close to Metal Gear Solid's voice acting. You had David Hayter of, um, if anyone knows, Guyver. He was in a, a Guyver movie, as well as he's a scriptwriter for the two X-Men films, the original X-Men films. Um, 
he voiced Snake. He voiced Snake up until the the fourth game. No, actually, sorry, the uh, what I like to call the fifth game, Peace Walker. Um, and he still he still voices Snake to this day. He's actually Snake in Smash Brothers, so in the new Smash Brothers. But amazing voice work from him, uh, Cam Clark, Paul Eiding, just wow, just amazing. Um, brought life to the characters, and each of these characters were so unique and different, you know, especially the bad guys, Foxhound's kind of special forces that have gone rogue, uh, Psycho Mantis was a standout. Now, I haven't mentioned as well on top of all those things, because this is just off the top of my head, there's no script, um, the whole Psycho Mantis uh, reading your memory card thing that was so fucking amazing back in the day, you know, back in 1998. Um, Talking to the player, breaking the fourth wall, which would become a, another stable for the series, you know, as it as it progressed. Yeah, basically, Psychomantis will read your memory card, um, tell you what games that you've been playing, what saves you have on your memory card, and the only way to beat him is to unplug your controller and plug it into the uh, the second port in order to fight him. So that was so unique, and it would. Go on to become something that Kido Kojima did a lot in in the uh, Metal Gear series. You know, played with the with the player basically, <laughs> messed around with the player, and broke a lot of fourth walls. Now, obviously, I have to move at a steady pace, otherwise this you know this uh, podcast will be too long. Like, it'll be like over three hours. But all I want to say is Metal Gear Solid is such a classic game. It needs to be played whether you can play it on your PSP, download it on PSN, whatever way. Get the um. Ultimate Legacy Collection, which is uh, what I bought. I actually bought it um, from Amazon. I, it wasn't released in, in the UK, as usual. Most things aren't. But I got um, the American version of the game. Obviously, it plays on my, my PlayStation 3. And it's got Metal Gear Solid uh, 1, 2, 3, uh, Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2, Metal Gear Peace Walker, and Metal Gear Solid 4. So it's a, a great find, um, a good buy. And it is well worth, like, the 30 or 35 quid that you you know you have to pay for it because it's such a good collection of, of games um so yeah get that start from metal gear solid one do not and i repeat do not start you know with peace walker or metal gear 2 or something like that you need to play this series from the very beginning um so start with metal gear solid uh, it's not like resident evil in that aspect you know where you could just sort of jump into any resident evil game and not really care what's going on in the story with Metal Gear Solid, you really do have to know what's going on, you know, from the very beginning. So Metal Gear Solid is the the, uh, the base of that intertwining, you know, lore and plot that you get when you play the, uh, the whole series. So play from the first one and go from there. Okay, so we've talked about Metal Gear Solid quite enough. I'm going to move on to Metal Gear Solid 2. Metal Gear Solid 2 is the reason why I bought a PlayStation 2, hands down. Um, obviously we had Devil May Cry and other games like that that I found out were coming out later but straight off the bat Metal Gear Solid 2 was the reason I bought a PlayStation 2 and I actually bought Zone of the Enders which by the way is a good game not as good as its sequel but it's a good game but I bought Zone of the Enders much like a lot of people because I wanted to to get the Metal Gear Solid 2 demo I wasn't disappointed I think I played that demo at least 10 to, to 15 times over and over again um, the amount of stuff that you could do in this game compared to the first one, um, the fact it controlled smoother, uh, Snake looked cooler, the graphics, oh my god, the graphics of the time were amazing, they still look good to this day, but Jesus, if you want to know what next gen was about, then you played the Metal Gear Solid 2 demo to find out what next gen was about. This game was amazing, and... The, the amount of freedom and just stuff that you could do, things that you could interact with in the game was, um, or in, the, in not even the full game, in the demo, because there was even more in the full game. Um, wow, what an amazing achievement of a game. But after the, the demo, you know, we waited a little bit because the game was delayed, you know, due to what happened at the time with 9-11 and stuff like that. There was some, some things in the game that the developers thought were a little too close to home and mirrored the kind of terrorist attack on, on the Twin Towers. So they got rid of that stuff and the game was delayed for a little bit. When we finally got the game, we got our hands on the game. Um, we got to play through that tanker section as Snake and, you know, we were we were ready to like continue Snake's story. I mean, there's this whole cliffhanger at the end of the first game 
that shows you there's this third brother called Solidus. So it's Liquid, Solid and Solidus. And Ocelot has been working for him. So we wanted to see the story progress after that tanker section that we played already and see, you know, what happened to Snake. But Hideo Kojima decided to troll everybody and guess what? You don't get to play as Solid Snake for basically most of the game. You play as him during the tank section, but then you end up playing as a character called Raiden. This pissed off a lot of people, um, including myself and a friend of mine as well. It was the first time he was playing a Metal Gear game. He knew a little bit about, you know, Metal Gear Solid and he wanted to play a Solid Snake. This is coming from someone who didn't even have any attachment to the series up to that point. But yeah, the fact that you weren't playing a Solid Snake and the game had been touted as Solid, Solid Snake's like next adventure um, pissed me off as well as a lot of other people, including my friends. So the thing is with Metal Gear Solid 2 though, the game itself is maybe my favorite Metal Gear Solid game. I've got to be honest, next to Peace Walker. Uh, it's my second favorite. And the reason for this is there was context behind playing as Raiden. You got to see um, what Solid Snake was like from someone else's viewpoint. And myself as well as my friend, as we played the game more and more as time has passed, we've got to see why Hideo Kojima did that. Now, is Raiden a decent character? Eh, yes and no. Um, he's a whiny little bitch at times. However, there is a reason behind why he's whiny and there is, you know, kind of a lack of emotion and stuff like that. Um, behind his character, there is a reason and you get to find this out later on in the game that in fact he's not this uh, soldier that's a rookie and, you know, wet behind the ears and stuff like that. He's, in fact, he's a, he's a child soldier. And Solidus was his commanding officer, but also, as he claims, his father, a father figure. Um, Metal Gear Solid 2 chose to show you Solid Snake from someone else's perspective, who in themselves is probably a better soldier than Solid Snake, realistically, because he's only ever known war and grown up around war. Now, we all know that Solid Snake's the best, yeah? Like, Raiden doesn't beat Solid Snake, but what I'm trying to say is within the, the context of the story, uh, Raiden is actually a more highly skilled and trained soldier than Solid Snake is. That says a lot. So, the whole kind of bait and switch, you know, that Kojima pulled on everybody, it annoyed people, but as time has, has passed, you kind of understand why he did that. To have Solid Snake go through these, these situations that Raiden does, like meeting another cyber ninja, you know, like from the first game, and there's a lot of, like, callbacks to Shadow Moses, what happened in the first Metal Gear Solid. Uh, Snake would know that something's not right, and he would cotton on to this, and, you know, he's not that dumb. So Raiden is a complete blank slate for the player. Um, it's a way to almost, like, grab people's attention that aren't familiar with the Metal Gear Solid games, yeah, up until that point. And, uh, and build a new fan base, but at the same time, there's a lot of other things that happen in the game where you kind of have to know uh, bits and pieces from the first game, so it makes people want to go and play the first game. It's been done a lot of times in films, a lot of times in games. Um, but, yeah, Solid Snake's just too smart for that sort of stuff. Um, Raiden, even though he's a very highly skilled soldier, etc., etc., he's not the, the brightest of the bunch. He's not the sharpest when knowing something's up. And so that's why Kojima done it. And you do get to see Solid Snake. Um, in this game, he is also known as Iroquois Pliskin. And ugh, Kojima did it on purpose. There's no way that he put, you know, Solid Snake in the game, called him Iroquois Pliskin, and then basically expected the player not to know who the fuck Iroquois Pliskin was. It's clear that it's Solid Snake from the very first time you meet him. Kojima knew this. Everybody else knows this. There you go. Um, then it's revealed that he is Solid Snake, he tells Raiden, etc, etc. And the story progresses. Uh, we get to find out more about Revolver Ocelot, the fact that he's behind the scenes, you know, working for the Patriots. He's not actually working for Solidus, he's actually working for the Patriots. And uh, some other stuff that happens. Obviously, to go through it in, in like an hour-long podcast would, would be too long. But the plot of the game is something that keeps me coming back time and time again. And you know what? A lot of what was mentioned in a 2000, or I think it was 2001, um, video game has actually come to pass in today's society. Um, basically, the game's main theme is the control of the internet. And guess what, everybody? That stuff's coming to pass um, in this day and age. So, 
I highly suggest you go and play Metal Gear Solid 2. Um, like I said, start with the first game, play the second one, because my god, you'll be blown away with how much that game actually gets right, or at least the story actually gets right um, in today's day and age. But you know what, Kojima has done it with other games in the series as well, but we'll move on to that a bit later. Um, Gameplay-wise, everything returned from the original Metal Gear Solid, but you know now you could you could go into first person view um and the amount of like interaction you had with the env environment was like times a hundred compared to the original game uh, also something that was unique was context sensitive controls so if you want to fire your trank gun you can hold down the the square button hard and then release it and you will fire a trank dart if you only hold down the square button lightly you'll just aim your trunk tranquilizer gun stuff like that was great it was revolutionary for the time uh, then you had just the little quirks and unique sort of things within the game like if you walk over a mesh grate it will make noise the guard will spot you uh, you could destroy like glass um, bottles and as well as as guards riot shields you know soldiers riot shields if you put enough shots from your handgun into them they will splinter into a thousand pieces stuff like that the little touches and stuff in metal gear there's so many there's too many there's too many easter eggs to even talk about in this podcast if you go and play the game uh you won't even find half of them there's so many things in that game that i can't even just list them off here and, and now because it would take hours but just know that uh, metal gear solid even to this day metal gear solid 2 sons of liberty is a very very well made uh, intricately pieced together masterpiece of a game um, it is a cyberpunk slash tech noir thriller that's how i perceive the game uh, other people might not but that's how i perceive it um the story is full of surprises and plot twists and links to the the first game in many ways uh the the boss battles are, oh, I haven't even talked about the boss battles, the boss battles are amazing in this game. Much like the first game, uh, some of the boss battles top the first games, like the Harrier fight, or um, you know, the, the fact that you have to face multiple Metal Gear Rays in this. Uh, but yeah, Jesus, wow. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention something that will become a staple of Metal Gear games um, after Metal Gear Solid 2. Harry Gregson Williams' amazing score for the game. Now, Harry Gregson Williams, for people who aren't familiar with him, is a, a film composer. He's worked on films like Shrek, Ants, uh, The Martian, The Taken of Pelham 1, 2, 3, Enemy of the State. He, he's done a lot of uh, musical scores for like action movies. He is a legend when it comes to films, you know, in terms of like their musical scores. So to bring him over and, and put him on Metal Gear Solid 2 and see what he could bring to the table, he done, done a bang up job, he done a perfect job, as you can imagine. Um, he is legendary for a reason. And Metal Gear Solid 2 has an amazing score. As a game, Metal Gear Solid 2 is probably my second favourite, or it's basically in line with Peace Walker. I gravitate more towards the whole um, artificial intelligence side of, of Metal Gear Solid, you know, and these evil AIs trying to take over the world and, you know, and enslave humanity. I, I find that to be the most interesting aspects of Metal Gear Solid. And I do like the fact that it's not an enemy that, that Solid Snake can just go toe-to-toe -to -toe with fist-to-fist, -fist, you know, it's this enemy that he can't do that with um unlike say liquid snake and stuff i mean metal gear solid has a lot of you know antagonists within its storyline and its plot and its games but the overall antagonists of everything are the patriots and it's great that we have this this enemy much like skynet from the terminator films that you can't actually like punch in the face basically so metal gear solid 2 i really really hope if you listen to this podcast that you have never played the game and you've never played the Metal Gear series in any form um, and this is your first time playing Metal Gear Solid 2 because it is going to surprise you, shock you and uh, and spin your head around. That's how good it is and the storytelling is spot on. It's amazing. It's probably the highest kind of peak that Kojima has reached when it comes to storytelling within the Metal Gear Solid games. So yeah, play Metal Gear Solid, then move on to Metal Gear Solid 2. You won't be disappointed. And if you've already played the game, well, you know where I'm coming from when I say that it's a masterpiece. So. Or hopefully you share the same sentiments. You don't have to. You know, your favourites might be 3 or, or 4 or whatever. So moving on from Metal Gear Solid 2, we're going to talk about Metal Gear Solid 3. Snake Eater. So, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. Now, originally, I thought this was a bit of a, a black sheep of the family. Um, I did not 
gravitate towards this game. I'll be honest. I finished it twice and I still didn't like it. I got rid of it and then I rebought it again um, in its subsistence form. It was cheesy. It borrowed a lot from cheesy James Bond movies, Rambo, um, just 80s action films in general. Stuff that I should have liked but just didn't like at that point in time. Uh, it went back in time. You now played as Big Boss. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with who Big Boss is, uh, Big Boss is the uh, legendary soldier within kind of the Metal Gear universe. And um, he's the guy that Snake kills in Metal Gear Solid... No, sorry, Metal Gear 2, uh, Solid Snake. Um, and he is kind of like the crux of the entire kind of Metal Gear Solid plotline, you know? Everything kind of goes back to, to Big Boss. And in Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, we get to play as a very young, uh, wet behind the ears, Big Boss, basically, isn't it? His real name is Jack. Um, much like Raiden's real name is Jack, so there's a connection with Metal Gear Solid 2. But, you know, for someone who was left perplexed by Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty's kind of cliffhanger ending, you know, after the credits we find out there's um, 12 wise men, but they've been dead for like over 100 years. Um, to want to know what happened after that point and to find out who the Patriots actually were and, you know, what these AIs were doing and stuff like that, to have it just kind of all get dashed away and then Kojima make a game that was a prequel and set way before those events even took place was a kick in the nuts. Way worse than finding out we were playing as Raiden in Metal Gear Solid 2, I've got to be honest. It was a kick to the fucking nutsack. However, Snake Eater's story does actually incorporate all the stuff that was talked about in Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 2. It just doesn't do it in a um, in-your-face way. It does it very subtly. And those 12, 12 wise men are actually, you know, explained within the story. They're just not called the 12 wise men. Um, they're just basically these old guys from different countries. China, Russia, and America. The three superpowers at the time. And... You do get to find out that they are possibly the 12 wise men and the reason they've been dead for 100 years is because they, they lived, you know, way back when, in the 1940s. The thing is though, Metal Gear Solid 3 doesn't actually centre in on that one part of the story. It's almost glossed over very quickly. Um, it's there, but it's not the main plot point of Metal Gear Solid 3. Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater is just a fun game. That's what... I kind of realised when I played it more and more over over the years and as time's gone on, I realised that Kojima just made a fun game that didn't have to be seriously connected to Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 2. Instead, he made this almost like open style world. He was very into GTA at that point. I think he still is in some ways um, and Red Dead Redemption. But he, he made this game where you could just go and do anything you wanted to do, take on missions in any ways you wanted to take them on, um, with just like loads of fun outcomes and loads of like interactive environments and, and fun items that you could pick up and tons of weapons. This game had so many weapons in it. Um, and yeah, it was just a load of fun. Now it built upon the engine that Kojima used for Metal Gear Solid 2, but you know, it added so much. I mean, once again, like Metal Gear Solid 2, I can't list off the amount of things uh, you can do and, and items you can pick up and just fun to be had because it would be like a five hour video. But what I will say is um, it's just loads more of what Metal Gear Solid 2 did, but it, it does even more with what it's got. Um, you have like encampments you can just run into and, and either sneak into or just shoot your way through. Um, the guards are, are smarter, the AI is better, um, you can interact the scenery more so you can hide in trees and, you know, just hang off of like a, a branch and, and take off soldiers that way, you know, basically put them to sleep or, or kill them. The story is well told, it's hokey, it's cheesy, but it's fun. Um, it has a great bad guy, I think he's possibly the best bad guy within the series actually, and that's Colonel Volgan. He's so over the top and so stupid. But, um, yeah, I love him as, as a, an antagonist within uh, the Metal Gear series. He's brilliant. There is a reason as to why, you know, Kojima tried to put him in Metal Gear 5, although it didn't work very well, but we'll get onto that. Uh, Enemies-wise, great variation. You know, if you're used to Metal Gear Solid, you'll know that the enemies all have balaclavas, and uh, they're all dressed in the same kind of garb as soldiers would be, but you do get variation. And there's loads of extra other bits, like you can... Kill bosses before before you even fight them. Uh, there's a bit where you you come across the end 
um, during a cutscene and after that finishes you can actually snipe a barrel and kill him uh, before you, you even face him so talking about the end and bosses in general um, there's this this sniper rifle battle that could last days depending on your skill level um, if it does the end dies uh, due to old age um, the game actually counts the amount of days that are part that have passed um, in real time and yeah he can die uh, or you can just snipe him in a normal sniper battle bosses wise at first I was like what the hell are these dudes like literally they're so stupid but now I've come to love them you know for their kind of cheesiness and stuff like that um, you have a dude that can fire beats out of his mouth and from his, his hands and stuff like that you have you know a guy who's photosynthetic and uh, his eyes pop out like a chameleon's and move you know in different like positions um, you have a guy Volgan that, that is able to like harness electricity why who cares this is Metal Gear Solid Snake Eater it doesn't have to make sense and these boss battles are really interesting and fun to play like they're probably the best boss battles within the whole franchise within the entire series um, fighting the fury as he sets everything alight and it's almost like Vulcan Raven where you have to kind of stay out of his his you know his line of sight um, and then get him with his back's turned and stuff like that but he sets fire to everything and just the amount of effects and stuff on show like the flame effects just even to this day they, they are very impressive um, then you have like bosses like the sorrow where you don't actually have to attack him you shouldn't attack him um, you've got to kind of get to the end of the stage and uh, I'm not going to ruin any more because it would spoil the fun of that particular boss battle and it would ruin the game for anyone who hasn't played it but it's a very unique and interesting way to fight him if there was any boss that I didn't really like I guess it would be the fear the fear just he can get cheesed really easily um, you have to use infrared to see where he is he has like a cloaking technology and he's just not that interesting he leaps from like branch to branch uh, while he's in the trees and stuff and you just kind of shoot him or give him like rotten food and then he you know he poops up on it and you can go and attack him but yeah he'd be my least favorite but every other boss other than the fear i really really like really like like um the the end boss that is um basically colonel volgan atop like the metal gear for this game called the shagahod and he's just basically chasing you and there's this on rail section where you have to shoot out the I don't know what to call them. They're not really wheels. Uh, they're kind of like these these drills that move the Shagahod. You have to shoot those out, and then you know you can uh, fight Volgan, shoot Volgan. But yeah, it's great. Like for an on rail section as well, it's really well done. Um, this game is probably more cinematic as well than the other two. And how I mean that is, there's a lot more cutscenes if I remember right, um, and a lot more moments that are more cinematic than in Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 2. But overall, I have grown to really, really love Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater because of its its charm and the fact that it is goofy and it doesn't give a, give a shit. Like, it, it just wants to have fun with the player and immerse you in this Cold War era, you know, spy adventure featuring, like, one badass protagonist in the form of Big Boss and, you know, he gets to meet all these colorful and, and wacky characters along the way. Once again, much like Metal Gear Solid 2 and 1, the voice acting is spot on. Uh, Harry Gregson Williams returns to do the score, and once again, it's great. Um, some of my favourite characters, next to Big Boss, Major Tom, or Zero, as he's known, is great. He's a very, like, straight-up British Army officer, you know, um, for Queen and Country, sir, that type of guy, but... He comes into play a little bit uh, later down the line in the story, so we'll get to him eventually. But for now, you know, he's just a lovable, like, CO of, uh, of Big Boss. Then we have Volgan, who I've explained earlier was one of my favourite antagonists within the series. And we have the boss. Now, the story is very centred on the boss. The boss is this legendary soldier that fought during World War II, and her real motives and her personality and stuff are a mystery up until kind of the later games, when you, you do understand, you start to understand what she was trying to achieve. But she's just very patriotic to America, and she just wants to protect her home country, and that's what she does, essentially. Um, but she gives her life uh, in order to do that, and she hands over the mantle of... Um, the boss over to Jack, who then becomes Big Boss, uh, because he has to kill her. 
One thing that you can never take away from Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater is the fact that it has a lot of heart and uh, it's the most emotional story within the series. I'm going to, you know, admit to that. Um, 1 and 2 are a little bit colder compared to this game. They do have heart and they do have emotional moments, but even though 3 is goofy at times and silly and it's just, it's just a load of fun as well, silly fun, um, it is also the most emotional within the series. And I can't ever forget, you know, that that ending scene with Snake, or at least Big Boss, uh, saluting the boss's grave, and you see that single tear roll down his face, um, showing that he genuinely loved her, you know, as a soldier and as, like, a friend. And then the game switches to the credits, and you hear that, that great song by Star Sailor. Yes, Metal Gear Solid 3. Um, in actual fact, I would say that you could end up playing Metal Gear Solid 3 as your first entrance into the Metal Gear series, um, because this is a... Anomaly within the the rest of the series you can actually play this game out of kind of context and, and outside the uh, The rest of the games and you wouldn't really need to know what's going on But it does help with some of the the second games like plot twists and the first games plot twists if you kind of have a handling on who big boss is and You know kind of who the Patriots are as well as Revolver Ocelot and stuff like that because it's a it's a prequel so Revolver Ocelot's like origin stories are in this game but really in all fairness you could play three um having not played one or two so yeah Metal Gear solid three snake eater another masterpiece much like the the previous games if i had to rate these games i'd say that the first the first game was like a 10 out of 10 the second game was a 9 out of 10 and snake eater is like a 9 out of 10 the first game's a 10 out of 10 just because it was like the first of its kind and uh, revolutionary. That's the only reason, but other than that, I think they would all get like nines across the board from me. Moving on, we have Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. Now, I didn't play this game until I got myself a PSP um, later on down the line. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Portable Ops. I played through it, I completed it, I didn't like it. I'm going to be honest, this is the first game in the series that wasn't directed by Hideo Kojima. He was a, a producer in some form or another, but it just it just wasn't that great. It moves the plot along, um, but it fucks around with some of the plot, and I'm not saying that this director of this game, I can't remember who he was, but I'm not saying that he he's not the first person to um, you know tinker with the, the game's overall lore and plot, because Hideo Kojima has done that multiple times. Uh, he'd done it with Metal Gear Solid 3, you know, even though it, it talks about the 12 wise men, or at least who the Patriots were originally um, in Metal Gear Solid 3, the fact that they've actually been dead for like a hundred years and there were specific people that it, it tried to show you, um, that's all kind of changed and retconned in Metal Gear Solid 3. So he, he retconned some stuff in Metal Gear Solid, you know, that uh, was featured in Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 on the Super Famicom. And he also retconned uh, some stuff in Metal Gear Solid 2 as well, you know, from Metal Gear Solid. So Hideo Kojima does this a lot. You're going to find this as I talk about the games, there's a lot that gets retconned. And Port Warps is no different. Um, Frank Yeager or Grey Fox, um, the cyber ninja from Metal Gear Solid, is featured in uh, Port Warps. And his story's completely changed, as well as some other plot points. Um, overall, the game just... It kind of plays a bit differently from the others. It's um, very mission-based. Um, you have to recruit soldiers. This is from what I can remember. And bring them back to your base of operations. It was a very early concept that would be used in Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. And it would be built upon. Um, in Port Ops, it's just annoying and frustrating. You have no uh, way to grab the soldiers other than actually knocking them out and bring them back to this truck, and it gets tedious very fast. Story-wise, I think Roy Campbell's in it as well, the Colonel from Metal Gear Solid. He's a younger version of himself, but like I said, this game retcons a lot. It doesn't make sense that he met Big Boss a long time ago, and then he doesn't even mention him in the future games in Metal Gear Solid and, and MGS2. Well, he's uh, an AI in Metal Gear Solid 2, but you, you get where I'm going with this. Um, Graphically, the game was sound, the music was great, you know, the weapons and stuff you get to use are all cool, tri typical Metal Gear fashion, the sneaking's done properly, but the game just stunk of add-on, do you know what I mean? It just stunk of, like, 
uh, tie-in and yeah it just didn't I didn't gel with it I finished it I completed it 100% but I think this is where Metal Gear Solid started to show some cracks as a series for me personally and then came the graphic novels that were retellings of Metal Gear Solid story and Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty story and I just don't really think we needed those we didn't need a retelling of those two game stories but I've looked through them, I've read them, or watched them, or whatever, and um, yeah, they're cool, they just weren't really needed. Um, now next we have Metal Gear Solid 4, a game that Hideo Kojima did not want to make, but was almost, in his words and Konami's words, forced into making it. He'd received death threats uh, with the fact that Metal Gear Solid 3 was the end of the, the franchise, um, the end of the series. He wanted it to be the end of the series. Death threats are ridiculous when it comes to anything, any form of media, video games, films, you know, music. It's ridiculous that you will send someone a letter that says, I'm going to fucking kill you um, if you don't make, you know, another game in the series. As a fan, though, I was left wanting more after Metal Gear Solid 3, I'm not going to lie. Now, yes, I do understand that Metal Gear Solid is all about the player's interpretation of what's happening on screen. Um... The things that they feel emotionally when they play the games and the fact that the stories don't have to you know fully tell you what's going on um and it's for you to kind of decide what the story's about and you know what you take from it i get that having seen films like prometheus or inception that don't fully tell you what's going on they don't you know tie up any loose ends that might have been left stuff like that you know I get it, I get what Kojima does with these games and I think it's very clever and it's great that we, we have games where, you know, even with the second game, even though 4 kind of retcons some of uh, the second game's plot and, and stuff like that and lore, we can still say that, that 2 had some bits in it that were unexplainable and were left down to interpretation of that individual person. Now here's where things get a little bit tricky though. Kojima as an actual writer isn't that great. He's good. But he's not that amazing on his own. Um, now, as far as I can tell or remember, I'm not going to go and research this, but I believe Hideo Kojima, along with two other people, um, handled the script and the ideas, you know, for Metal Gear Solid, as well as the concepts and stuff like that. Those two people left, and Hideo Kojima was the only one kind of, you know, holding the fault. And it shows with Metal Gear Solid 4. It shows the writing isn't as tight. Um, the ideas aren't as clever here and there. But even though Metal Gear Solid 4 is a train wreck, my god is it a beautiful train wreck. You know, it does a lot that really appeases fans of the series. It really does tie everything off um, nice and neatly. Or as le at least as neat as it can. Um, it's a game that's that was born out of frustration and I would say a little bit of anger uh, towards fans and the diehard fans, you know, the ones who are sending him like these, these fucked up letters. Um, it takes liberties with some things. It almost kills Snake Off, which I know a lot of people would have been pissed if they'd have seen that actually happen on screen. It fully shits on whatever Metal Gear Solid Sons of Liberty's like story tried to do and, and the story it tried to tell. There's hardly any gameplay. I mean, what gameplay there is, it's amazing. Um, you can do pretty much everything you did in the previous games, but uh, there's loads more. Obviously, I'm not going to list it off here because it takes take hours and hours, like I said before, but whatever gameplay there is, is great. Unfortunately, the game story and cutscenes take over, like, most of that gameplay. And you are sat there watching a six to seven hour movie, basically. But... Here's the thing. I love Metal Gear Solid 4. I do. Even though it's this seven hour long cutscene. I, I love it for that. I love the fact that I get so much information pumped into me. That, you know, grabs from all the previous games in the series. And it ties off loose ends. It comes up with ideas about certain plot points that couldn't be explained. Vamp, for example, he could uh, run on water. And he kept, you know, being brought back to life. Well, that was because he has these new kind of special type of nano machines that run through his blood and stuff like that so it brings him back to life it heals wounds etc etc is it silly of course it is it's fucking ridiculous but it's still fun if you've got into metal gear solid to to get into like a serious story and serious game then uh you kind of got into it for the wrong reasons because metal gear solid has always been hokey cheesy stupid fun okay so 
when you get something that's just like here just have everything like including the kitchen sink you know Kojima just throws everything at you as a fan and it does pay off it really does I mean Johnny Sasuke uh, Marion Merrill okay whatever you have a we have a, a wedding at the end of the game um, Solid Snake doesn't kill himself if, you know it's left that he'll die from old age cool you know uh, he's a ticking time bomb uh, he doesn't carry Fox Die in his blood anymore. He has this new version of Fox Die. Great, whatever. If it means that I don't see him, you know, killing himself on screen, I'm happy with that. It's cool. He can die off screen and it's fine. Stuff like this is so interesting to me. And the game is still clever. Hideo Kojima is still clever, even though he's, you know, not the, that great at script writing on his own. Um, he does do things like Age Snake because of the fact that he's a clone. So he ends up being this this old man who, during battles, can um, have like a disc pop out, and so he'll hold his back and you know, and then have to straighten his back up. Little touches like that are amazing. Um, when you do get to play the game, it's so fun. Like it's one of the best pieces of game design that I've you know that I've experienced throughout my whole history of gaming. And uh, I personally think it's a lot better than Metal Gear Five game design. That's me on a personal like side note. Now, if you wanted to know what happened to Snake after Metal Gear Solid 2 story, you're going to be very happy playing this game because it continues on from Metal Gear Solid 2. It doesn't continue from, from 3. It's not the story of Big Boss. We go back to it being the story of Solid Snake and we get to play as Solid Snake throughout the whole duration of this game. Voice acting's on point. The, the music and sound design, once again, amazing. Uh, I believe Harry Griffin Williams returned for this game as well. And it shows, you know, the, the soundtrack's brilliant. David Hayter reprises his role as Snake and he's a lot more old, withered, gruff, you know, in his in his voice and I love what David Hayter did with the character. Um, all the voice acting is on point once again. There's a great plot twist at the end. I'm not going to ruin it, even though I could. Some of you probably have played Metal Gear Solid 4, but uh, the, the, the very end of the game, that blew me away and the way they did it was, it was a very James Bond will return kind of um, ending, you know, within the credits and stuff, so... The story is brilliant, it rounds off the whole Patriot storyline that was introduced in the second game. And we get to also find out uh, a few more kind of unexplained plot points that took place during Snake Eater, so that's cool. The main bad guy in the game, I'm going to ruin it right now because I talked about him earlier, it's Major Tom. It's uh, Zero himself, you know, the, the moustache twiddling, even though he doesn't have a moustache, but he's the typical moustache twiddling um, English bad guy. Uh, but in this he's like, he's basically comatose and he shows up at the end. But you get to find out that he is the guy along with Big Boss, uh, Paramedic, the DARPA Chief Donald Anderson and Eva from Metal Gear Solid 3. They were the guys that started up the Patriots uh, system of AI. So that's very interesting. It's a very shock moment. I'm like, oh, okay. A lot of people don't like it. I don't really know why. They seem to think that Major Tom was a bit goofy and stuff. Uh, all the characters in Metal Gear Solid are goofy, so it d didn't surprise me that he might be, you know, um, this this kind of evil mastermind behind everything. Even though he's not technically evil, none of the, the bad guys and stuff are evil in the Metal Gear Solid series. Uh, they just have their own reasons for doing things and why they want to become terrorists. Some of them are evil, I guess, if, if you want to put a pin on it, but... Yeah, not everybody is, and Zero isn't really like your typical evil bad guy. It's explained more in Metal Gear Solid 5. Um, overall, the story was great. It was a great finisher to Metal Gear Solid 2 story in Metal Gear Solid. You get to see Raiden make a comeback, and now he's this badass cyborg ninja. And uh, we'll go on to Metal Gear Rising after this, but um, yeah, he was kick-ass in the game. Uh, the story is so twisty-turny and so many plot points and so many things that I'm not going to bother even trying to um, explain any of it. But if you stuck with this series for as long as I have, then you're going to enjoy this game. You are. And you're not going to mind that there's very little gameplay as opposed to, you know, like cutscenes and movie and stuff like that. Um, it's great for people that just want to know what happens and how the story rounds off and finishes. And so... Kojima ended the series with, in my opinion, my personal opinion, a bang instead of a, a whimper, you know. I think Metal Gear Solid 4 did what it was supposed to do, you know. It rounded off the series and it gave us something 
that was close to closure, basically. Next we had a Metal Gear Solid Rising, or I think it's Metal Gear Revengeance, that's it, yeah. Metal Gear Revengeance, and this is a game that takes place way ahead in the future, way after Metal Gear Solid 4. It seems that Snake's still alive, I will say that right now. He doesn't appear in the game, but um, Raiden does mention him at one point, and it seems like he's still going, he's still ticking. Now, Metal Gear Revengeance is basically the story of Raiden, and it takes place, like I said, after MGS4, and it, it, it follows Raiden's adventures after that game. And Hideo Kojima was originally set to direct the game that would take place between Metal Gear Solid 2 and Metal Gear Solid 4. It was going to be the story of Raiden becoming this badass cyborg ninja. But along the way, Kojima thought, why not hand it over to a different company? And so he let Platinum Games have a have a go at the, uh, the Metal Gear Solid franchise. They produced a game that is one of my favorite hack and slash games to this day. Um, it's up there with Ninja Gaiden, Devil May Cry. It's amazing. I love this game so much. Um, just like previous Metal Gear games, it's goofy, it's silly. It doesn't have some of the sentiments that the, the other games have or some of the emotion the other games you know portray, but it is still a kick-ass action game. And it makes Raiden pretty cool, you know, or Jack the Ripper, as he's known. Um, he gets to, to have a story all of his own. Uh, I know in Metal Gear Solid 2, he shared center stage with Solid Snake, but in this, it's just Raiden. It's all about Raiden. He's taking on terrorists in typical Metal Gear fashion. The end boss is amazing. The end boss fight is brilliant um, with Senator Armstrong. And I think that Armstrong is one of my favorite Metal Gear bad guys to date, uh, along with Volgan. I know people are going to be like, are you crazy? What about Solidus? What about Ocelot? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they're great. I, I love them as well. But Armstrong is just a loon, man. He's crazy. And I fucking love that. And he becomes this, like, overpowered... Dragon Ball Z, like, bad guy, you know, nano machines take over his whole body, turns grey at one point. This game is fucking nuts, it's crazy, and that's what I love it for. Uh, it has a mechanic that's great, it's called the slice, slice and dice mechanic, maybe that's not the official n name, but that's what I call it. And you can basically just, like, slow down time and chop up bad guys into, like, little pieces and grab their, like, their cyborg, um hearts and things like that and squash them to, to gain energy and power and re restore your life um raiden controls really well in this it's a bit weird he has a parry attack so if you press the button at the right time he will parry enemies there's no real dodge button no real roll it's all about the parrying and getting up close and personal when um taking on like bad guys and stuff like that waves of enemies so that's a great mechanic um along with the with the slice and dice one Raiden is very easy to control. Um, there's loads of scripted moments, as you'd expect, much like Uncharted and uh, other action games in that kind of elk. Uh, so yeah, it's brilliant. Like um, Raiden does have some stealth skills, but they're nothing like you know the other games. And this game isn't trying to be a stealth game. At the end of the day, it's a um, it's a straight hack and slash adventure game. Uh, I don't want to you know, gone too much about Metal Gear Revengeance, for whatever reasons, it's not really a, what I would call a direct sequel to the Metal Gear series, it's a spin-off. And I don't know if you're a die-hard Metal Gear Solid fan, if you just like the stealth mechanics of those games, if you're going to find anything in this game to warrant you getting it, but if you can go between Hack and Slashes and Metal Gear games and you know, like the two combined, then you're going to enjoy Metal Gear Rising. It still has a lot of like Metal Gear style to it let's just say that you know kind of with the bad guys the boss battles um the environments the fact that raiden at one point throws a metal gear ray with just his bare hands as a metal gear fan i was like that shit is cool and yeah the the soundtrack overall is really catchy it's really good it's not harry gregson williams this time but it's very good and quentin flynn returns to voice raiden and that's great because he he gives raiden a lot more edge this time and um, he's a lot darker as a character bit like he was in 4, but he's a bit more sadistic in this one. So when he, uh, it always cracks me up when he becomes like Jack the Ripper. He goes into Jack the Ripper mode. And uh, what Quentin Flynn does with his voice, it always has me like, like creasing up and laughing. It's brilliant. And let's not forget the uh, Go Ninja, Go Ninja child soldier that you rescue. Any game that references Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, uh, Secret of the Ooze, has my attention and deserves my respect. And the fact that this game references 
that film. I love that film. I grew up on, on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle cartoons and films as a kid. Um, you have a lot of respect from me, Platinum Games. I love that, that moment in the game. So, if you can find this game for cheap, and you're into hack and slash games, as well as Metal Gear Solid and, and stuff like that, go for it. Grab it. Now, next is the fifth and final game, in my personal and humble opinion, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. This is a game that, in my opinion, didn't have to be made. It was made. It's my favourite Metal Gear game, I think, next to Metal Gear Solid 2. Uh, it's a personal favourite. It doesn't score as high as the original, like I said, for reasons. Um, the original was unique, etc, etc. First one to do it, and uh, it had the most tight story, in my opinion. But even though maybe Peace Walker... Actually, you know what? No, Peace Walker is a 10 out of 10. Much like the, the first game. Uh, the second game is a 9 out of 10, but Peace Walker is, is up there with the, the first game. Yes, I love this game. It's probably my favourite Metal Gear Solid game to date. It's the fifth and final game. It stars Big Boss once again. It's a prequel, much like Snake Eater and Portable Ops were. And I just I just love it for what it does. Um, it takes that whole, you know, kidnapping soldiers and recruiting them thing from Portable Ops, but it does it in such uh, a good way. It does it in a way better way than that game did. And you can now attach Fulton uh, parachutes to soldiers. You lift them up. A plane comes by, picks them up, and that's how you recruit your soldiers. So, no more going to fucking trucks and having to put the soldiers in there. You can just send them up to the sky and back to your base with uh, one click. Now, Peace Walker does, you know, like the whole kind of control scheme from all the previous Metal Gear Solids, or at least Metal Gear Solid uh, Guns of the Patriots, you know, 4. Um, that makes a return, so it's behind Snake this time. It's an over-the-shoulder third-person camera angle. They also incorporated into Metal Gear 3 subsistence, I forget. But yeah, um, so a lot of that stuff returns. But in this, it's more like managing your base, you know, building up your base, uh, managing that, recruiting soldiers, um, to go into that whole thing, much like the other games with its items and weapons and all that other stuff and plot twists and stuff, would be uh, would take hours. But it does become fun. It can get tedious, but it is fun as well. Uh, watching your base kind of grow and build up, um, and you take on like various missions. So the game story and and the rest of it is actually you know through like a mission structure. And I do like the mission structure of the game. It reminds me of Times Bits 2 and, and games like that. Um, it suits the Metal Gear kind of style quite well. And you can go back and replay like various missions, get a better ranks, um, fought and better soldiers, uh, do better at boss battles, things like that. Most boss battles, which is something I really like, are mechanical. So you fight helicopters, you fight um, APCs, stuff like that. But as you get more into the game, you get to fight these these various Metal Gears. And these Metal Gears are controlled by extremely like intelligent AIs, so they don't need pilots. They can basically function on their own. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Once again, you could just say that everything has been retconned from the previous games. Why are there now these Metal Gears that can um, function on their own and, you know, these people have this amazing technology and you don't ever get to hear about it or you know, even witness it in the, the future Metal Gear games, or at least the future timeline of the Metal Gear games. Um, but they make for great boss battles. Some of my favourite boss battles are, are with these things, and they're named after, um, like, insects, so like uh, butterflies, like pupa, uh, chrysalis, things like that. It's great, and to hear them eerily kind of talk to you in this robotic tone and this robotic voice... Um, is great during boss battles. Overall, it fleshes out Big Boss's story as well. This is where you get to meet Kazuhiro Miller, who is actually McDonald Miller. <laughs> Once again, retcon. Uh, Kojima retcons that character. And now Kazuhiro is this, this Japanese, half Japanese, half American, gunfire, soldier of fortune type of character. Uh, he becomes friends with Big Boss. Cypher is involved in this, who is basically the Patriots and Zero. That's what they're called in this game. Like I said, to keep up with the plot points of Metal Gear Solid um, for this probably hour-long video, I think it's probably coming to, um, would just be ridiculous. 
but the story is well told. Um, it actually links with Metal Gear Solid 3 and Portable Ops, and it does show how Bo Big Boss becomes the, the character that you see in Metal Gear and you know this legend that is explained throughout the rest of the game's story. But being that this is a Metal Gear Solid game, it also retcons a ton of shit as well. So, like I said, Metal Gear is a plot that you need to follow from the very beginning, but at the same time, uh, some of the things you just kind of, you have to wave off really, you have to just shrug off because they will annoy you, you know, if you're into kind of very tight um, storytelling, then Metal Gear Solid isn't a series for you when it comes to plot. But overall, I think the game was, was well done, it's enjoyable, I like the fact that I can jump into it and go back over and play missions, you know, uh, that sort of style of game that it is lends to a lot of replayability maybe more than the other games in the series um i love the story the fact that you know it still has those real world elements um that creep into the, the game story and stuff and also it's the the tale of big boss and how he becomes you know this kind of delusional self-centered what he thinks he's doing is right type of character his mindset changes uh, he interprets the boss's will differently from what the boss wanted and he essentially becomes the big boss that we know and see in the future games or hear about at least in the future games he becomes a terrorist and the game ends with snake delivering a speech to his newly formed army saying that they're going to create out of heaven um the speech is very well handled by david hater and also it's kind of a bit sad as well because this would be the last time Hater would reprise his role for a main canon series entry of Metal Gear Solid. Um, although in the future he would go on to, you know, do bit parts basically for Snake in Smash Brothers and things like that. And fan made um, remakes of, of Metal Gear Solid. But if you want to talk about Kojima's relationship, Konami's relationship with David Hayer as the voice of, of Snake, that ended um, with Peace Walker. Now we come to the point in the podcast where I say Metal Gear Solid died for me as a series with um, with the, the end of Peace Walker. Um, Metal Gear Survive I haven't actually played. I can't really give you like a, a straight up opinion of the game. But from what I've seen, the fact that the game just looks sucky and there's no way I'm ever going to buy this game. Um, it just doesn't exist in my opinion. But when it comes to Ground Zeroes and Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, well... It started off rocky to begin with. Uh, first of all, Kojima made these games because Konami told him to make these games. Um, and maybe he tried to make these games as something completely new entirely. Uh, I know that Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain was called Project Ogre at one point. But Konami were like, nah son, you ain't gonna like just come out of a new IP. You better slap the Metal Gear name on that on that thing there and, um, and make some money for us. So Kojima did. And... It shows that, that Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, is not really like a Metal Gear game, like story-wise and, and everything else. It just doesn't strike me as a Metal Gear Solid game. That's just my own opinions. This is my podcast and my YouTube channel, and that's why I'm sharing my opinions. You guys might feel differently, but I'm sorry, other than the gameplay, the game fucking sucked. And um, I have played this game from start to finish four times, a total of four times. The game takes around 50 hours to complete like main main missions and stuff like that. And that's a lot of time I've spent with the game if you count the fact that I've um, I've restarted it and played it like, through four times. Uh, from the very beginning, building my character back up. There's no real replay value after you finish the game. I just played it four times because I wanted to love the game. I was trying to find something in the game that I could love and the fact that I wanted to say no this is a genuine Metal Gear Solid game and it, and it you know exists within the the canon and within the the rest of the series um having played it recently like a couple months ago I I'm sorry I have to be honest and say that it just doesn't strike any chords with me now let's go back to Ground Zeroes really quickly Ground Zeroes is actually pretty good um it carries on from Peace Walker. It's set in the 70s, around the same time that Peace Walker's set. Uh, it, I think it takes place like a couple of months after Peace Walker ends. You play as, you do play as um, Big Boss in this, and you infiltrate essentially, you know, a, uh, a Guantanamo Bay style of um, location called Camp Omega. 
Um, you find out that Paz, who was featured in Peace Walker, she was a, an agent of Cypher of Zero. Um, she's been kidnapped by this this bad guy called Skullface, who is uh, basically shown in the trailers to be someone from Big Boss's past that got everybody excited. Uh, but we'll get to that in a bit. And you also have to rescue Child Soldier Chico, who was in Peace Walker as well. They're both being held um, in Camp Omega. Big Boss sneaks in, you know, rescues them, and uh, exfiltrates out of a hot site. Using a little bit of uh, Metal Gear Solid terminology there. But yeah, the, the lead up to that, actually getting to explore um, Camp Omega is a great experience. But the fact that the game takes 20 minutes to complete the main story... Um, I think I did it in like 10. I think I did it even like in 10 minutes. Um, there isn't any real substance to the game. Like you just replay like these, these weird fucking shoehorned in like missions. Um, that are supposed to be like not canon. But they are um, things that could have happened you know story wise. It's a very strange experience. Now it's easy to tell that Ground Zeroes was supposed to be the like beginning segment or the the prologue to phantom pain it was supposed to come as part of phantom pain well guess what konami decided to chop that shit in half and charge people not 20 pounds not 15 pounds 60 whole pounds for this 10 minute experience that speedrunners can probably complete in three um it was fucking ridiculous and like I said, this is where things started to go downhill fast. I bought it for I think like £25 which I kick myself even now for having done that because I wanted to, after playing like the Metal Gear Legacy Collection, I wanted to play a new Metal Gear game. So I went out and I almost forced myself to buy Ground Zeroes thinking, ah oh, people are talking shit even if the main campaign you know, isn't that long or everybody's kind of uh, different to each other we all play games differently so I was like just because someone finished it in 20 minutes maybe they were super rushing through it um, it might not take me that long you know as long as they it took them it might take me a bit longer I was wrong um, the game has no real story like really let's be honest it's got a beginning and an end there is no real middle to it um, Paz dies she fucking gets blown up by a vagina bomb yes you heard that right there is a bomb that's planted in her, her womb. Yeah, so it was, you know, let's not even go there with how it got there, but anyway. Um, Skullface, there's no real, like, he, his character isn't revealed, you know, he, he disappears before you even, you know, get to Camp Omega. Um, Big Boss doesn't even get to meet him. Uh, it sets up kind of how Metal Gear Solid V is gonna play, and one thing I will say about the, you know, the later Metal Gear games, Ground Zeroes and, and Phantom Pain, is they play so fluidly and they're they're very nice to play and one thing i will say about the metal gear solid franchise is it's never been shy when it comes to graphics um ground zeroes as well as phantom pain are graphically amazing just like you'd expect from any metal gear game uh, or at least current gen metal gear game you know they do push the bar when it comes to, to graphics and character models weather effects uh, the way guns look everything down to the tiniest little details yeah everything is on point and spot on but the game overall isn't a meaty experience and it only starts to get going as it ends. So Snake travels back to Mother Base um, with Paz and Chico. He sees that Mother Base is being destroyed, you know, by Cypher's forces. There's a firefight going on between Big Boss's army and Cypher's army. It's all very existential to the fact that you built up this base in Peace Walker and now it's being destroyed, it's being torn down. Um, Big Boss manages to rescue Miller and also this random medic that gets on the, the helicopter. You're all going to know who this medic is in a, in a couple of minutes. But they get on the helicopter, the medic sees to Paz. She's got this kind of like lacerated V, you know, in her um, on her ab abdomen. And Chico's very worried because he's fallen in love with Paz, etc, etc. And that's when we get to hear Miller say those infamous lines. They played us like a damn fiddle. And uh, that became a meme soon after. There's all this stuff going on. Paz wakes up. Uh, she pushes the medic away. And she tells everybody that she's got a bomb, you know, basically planted in her. Yeah. Uh, she then risks her life to save theirs. Jumps out of the helicopter. 
and at that point explodes and just sends all this kind of like shrapnel and, and stuff you know flying towards uh snake big boss the medic gets in the way of snake it's pretty obvious it's him and it ends that's how the game ends and you get to listen to some tapes afterwards that kind of round off the story and, and bring you up to date ready for peace uh yeah no phantom pain my bad <laughs> get them all confused now so many kind of uh, pseudonyms to these games so yeah ground zeros was it was a great start great prologue but not amazing, not worth the money, and should have been included with Phantom Pain. It should have been the prologue to Phantom Pain. Now, do you want to know what happened to Chico? Well, guess what? He was killed off screen. He doesn't appear in Phantom Pain. He's he's dead. He's gone. Uh, Paz is actually definitely dead. She's 100% dead. Miller gets kidnapped by Skullface, um, and Big Boss is in a coma. The medic's whereabouts are unknown up until this point, but... Here's where Konami and Kojima really, really screwed over fans and just fucked everything up from here on in. And how they did that is with the multiple amounts of trailers, much like Resident Evil 2 Remake is doing at the moment, that spoiled everything, including the story. Um, unlike Resident Evil 2 Remake, at least I know kind of what, what the story's about with that game. Uh, with Metal Gear Solid, you know, Phantom Pain, I didn't have a clue what it was going to be about. I thought it was going to be this as the traders say, epic conclusion to the Metal Gear Solid saga. Um, you get to find out that Big Boss becomes a demon and, and who the hell Skullface is, you know, he's from some he's someone from Big Boss's past, who is he? He has this fucked up face, it could be anybody, you know? It could even be um, a character like Hot Coldman or, or someone like that. Maybe even Volgan back from the dead, I don't know. It could have been anyone but who he actually is, you know, in the game. Instead, Skullface is just some dude that worked for the fucking CIA or something and, you know, was behind the scenes and all this stuff. He's a character that Kojima just threw in there, basically. Um, not that he hasn't done this before, but it was even worse, like, the fact that this was, like, the, supposedly the end, what it is, it was the last game uh, that Kojima made, so... It was a kick in the nuts, and uh, not only that, but Kojima just kept repeatedly kicking people in the nuts because this whole game story doesn't have anything to do with with previous Metal Gear games, not really. Um, it doesn't end the saga, as he likes to say, and, Kaj and Konami like to kind of point out. Um, you get to find out in the trailers that you're playing as someone else and not Big Boss. Let's just go ahead and spoil it right now if you haven't played the game. And if you watch the trailers like I did, you'd know because Miller turns around to the camera and says, what about him? To one of the doctors. Um, you can see Big Boss clearly in a coma. You can see Miller's clearly on, um, you know, like an operating table or a gurney or whatever. And as soon as he turns around and says, but what about him? And, you know, kind of looks in the direction of a completely separate character you know well it's got to be the other guy it's got to be the medic uh not only that but the medic is this just nobody like he's like skull face just nobody within the series uh kojima's just like oh yeah look that's the dude who's like big boss's trusted you know soldier of all time blah 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 bullshit he's just thrown in there literally um and when you get to actually finally play the game for yourself and you're choosing like avatars and, and making making up faces and all that other kind of crap, um, you know that you're just definitely not playing as Big Boss. It's a fucking kick in the nuts, a kick in the teeth, a slap around the face with a wet fish because you want to see Big Boss as these trailers, you know, made it out um, turn into this demon character, this evil kind of dictator, um, terrorist type of character that we've got to hear about and and witness, you know, within previous Metal Gear games. But he literally shows up like twice in this game, and then you get to hear him talk on some tapes. Another thing that I hate about Metal Gear Five: uh, Phantom Pain or V. So everybody says, "Oh, it's not actually V," because you play as Venom Snake. So that's why the V's there. It's Five, okay? It's Metal Gear Five. Um, that's what Konami and Kojima wanted it to be. The fact that you have to gain a lot of the story and a lot of plot through listening to hours and hours of tedious cassette tapes, um, something that was kind of unique and I thought, oh, it's quite clever, 
in Peace Walker and Ground Zeroes gets turned into a fucking chore in this game. You literally have to sit there and listen to hours of tapes, hours of dialogue, that it's so boring and not to see it actually happen on screen just bored the shit out of me. I'd rather read a book of Phantom Pain at my own pace and have to listen to, to these people spout hours and hours of dialogue at their own pace, you know? Um, and just stuff about boring shit, like hamburgers, fucking hamburgers, Kazuhura Miller trying to teach um, this old Indian dude, co-talker, how to make hamburgers. Great, amazing, like, I really want to hear that. No, I don't. Did you ever wonder why those bosses were so, like, overpowered and, um, supernatural in Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater? No, no, same, neither did I, I just took it for what it was. Well, guess what? Metal Gear Solid 5 tries to explain that. Uh, the fact that they have these, these parasites in them. They had these parasites in them that, that gave them their abilities to fire bees out of their mouth and, um, can dislocate their arms and stuff like, like the fear did, but it basically tries to explain... Uh, why the bosses like unit were so supernatural it doesn't work i know that metal gear 4 explains the patriots but it does a good job in that uh, in my personal opinion metal gear 5 trying to explain why why these dudes could do the things they did and the fact they just use parasites like they do nano machines in the other games yeah, it's just stupid it didn't it didn't really need to be explained in, a, in an hour long tape uh, some of the tapes that I do find interesting are like the, the conversations with Zero and Miller or Zero and Ocelot and you get to kind of hear Zero before he fell into his, his catatonic state. Um, Skullface infects him with I think parasite DNA or some shit like that and uh, yeah he's on the way out basically but you get to see him visit like Jack, you know, the real big boss, and uh, you find out that he never really hated big boss, he just wanted to to work with him, but they shared two different ideologies, so, you know, it clashed and stuff like that, uh, but he never really wanted to kill him or anything like that. Um, Metal Gear 5 probably does the worst retcon, or retcons of all the games, uh, Liquid Snake's retcon to, to hell, like, I don't even remember Liquid Snake saying that he met Big Boss, but in this, yeah, he meets Big Boss, or at least he meets Venom. Uh, I don't know if he knows if it's Venom or Big Boss, who fucking knows what's going on. They introduce some new characters, like Quiet. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, Quiet, you know, her story and everything is, is the saving grace of this game. I don't think it is. I don't find her to, to be a particularly interesting character. Um, she's literally got, like... The tiniest bit of rag just covering up her titties. And she was made for that fact. Let's be honest. Let's not, you know, say, oh, well, she was made because... No, she was made so that people would get, you know, a face full of titties and an ass. And as much as I love when characters are, are you know, sexy, like Jill Valentine or um, Ada Wong or whatever, whoever, like Tomb Raider or Lara Croft. The the only thing is with that is, with, with Quiet, it was too much. It was, like, obvious what Kojima was trying to do with that character. Now... I remember Kojima saying something on Twitter that was basically, you know, pointing a finger at everybody that was um, slating him for Quiet's design, you know, choice and stuff like that. And he said, oh, you, you guys will be ashamed and you'll eat your words when you find out the, the truth. Now, I thought the truth would be clever. I thought it was going to be possibly like Quiet was transgender, you know, like it was actually Chico who had become a woman and then you get to find out he's Quiet. Uh, no, it was literally that Quiet can breathe through her skin and soak in water, basically drink through her skin and that's why she wears uh, minimal amounts of clothing. Now, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but that explanation of why Quiet wears minimal amounts of clothing is fucking retarded. And I started to look at Kojima like, are you okay, mate? Like, is this something in your brain that's not working properly? Like, what do you mean that we're all going to eat our words? I thought the transgender-like idea was more creative, you know, the fact it was Chico, he wants to be seen more as a woman, so he shows off more flesh, you know, that would have been way more interesting, but no. Uh, I'm apparently, I should be ashamed because Quiet is not only photosynthetic, but drinks water through her skin. The fuck? Like, okay. Um, it gets worse, there's loads more. Okay, so... Metal Gear Solid V is supposed to go into Metal Gear the first game and you find out that you don't actually kill Big Boss in the first Metal Gear, you kill his clone, you know, Venom Snake. 
the only thing that sucks with that, and people could be like, oh, well, it was, it was only because it was 8-bit graphics, is the fact that, as far as I could tell, Venom Snake didn't have, like, a robotic arm in Metal Gear. In this, he does, for the whole entirety of the game. So, that doesn't make sense. A lot of people are like, oh, well, it makes sense because, you know, Big Boss reappears in Metal Gear uh, 2, Solid Snake. Okay, but, you know, Vulcan reappears in this game, and he pretty much got, like, shot to shit. In Metal Gear 3, you know, all his bullets burst, you know, he had bullets wrapped around himself and they all like popped and burst and, you know, fucking shot through him. But in this game, guess what? Vulcan returns as this unnatural force, um, this like spectre basically type of boss character. He can destroy helicopters with a fireball that comes straight out of his hands. There's no explanation for this. Nothing to do with parasites or anything else. He's just completely like supernatural. Um, I mean, alright, I sound like, you know, I'm being a bit harsh and if I went with older Metal Gear Solid storylines, then why am I ripping this apart? Maybe because, um, I could put up with a story if it was actually, like, coherent in any way. Uh, this is, like, the most non-coherent Metal Gear Solid story ever, and I think what happens is, as I start to, to go through the story, you know, over and over again, all these inconsistencies and these stupid things that happen within the story that's already pretty messy to begin with um, start to kind of like shine through even more. Whereas before I could enjoy the stories and if anything kind of retarded happened, once again I'm not saying that in a der derogatory way, um, it wouldn't bother me as much. Now, gameplay wise the game's fantastic. Uh, one of the most addictive Metal Gear experiences I've ever played to date. But it gets dry pretty fast, um, there's a lot of like redoing things, uh, doing the same fucking thing over and over again, you have to grab about 150,000 fucking plants, you know, so that you can, can keep like your mother base going and surviving, uh, that whole like mother base thing, um, building your mother base and all that stuff, it, it becomes boring in this game, I'm gonna be honest. It's cool that you can explore Mother Base, but there's, there's fuck all to do on there. Other than going and seeing Huey and Marik, we'll get to him in a minute. Uh, quiet, or, or doing some challenges and stuff, which are just shooting targets. You can go and visit, like, this wildlife sanctuary thing that is, um, is kind of, like, separate to Mother Base. It's this extension, uh, where, you know, Big Bad Venom Snake, who is becoming a demon, rescues cute little sheep. And, and wolves and, I don't know, tortoises and shit. Um, yeah, he really does become a demon in this one, guys. So, next to that, we we have a story that... I want to get to this right now. We have a story that's unfinished. We have an unfinished game. We have a story that is unfucking finished Now, that is blasphemy when it comes to a Metal Gear game because these games pride themselves on their stories, you know? They're the games known for... You know, their stories and their over overuse of cutscenes. And this game's unfinished. Um, there's a plot point to do with Liquid Snake and Psycho Mantis that doesn't get resolved. It just ends with them kind of like stealing this massive Metal Gear uh, that's more powerful than any Metal Gear you've ever seen, even though it's before Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 2 and all those other ones. Um, they st he steals it with like loads of these African child soldiers. They fluff into the distance, into the sunset, never hear from them again. The only time you get to find out what actually fucking happened to them is if you um, got the special edition, which comes with a, uh, you know, a DVD that tells kind of the story of this mission that wasn't included in the actual game. And it's called Kingdom of the Flyers or something like that, or Kingdom of the Lost Children or some shit. And it, it details what happens to, to Liquid as well as Psycho Mantis. Psycho Mantis does a Superman and, and saves Liquid from like you know, the, the whole, like, island or wherever they are, getting firebombed by a big boss or venom snake or whatever. Um, but yeah, even though it's it's a load of old shit and it really isn't that that great, um, it still should have been included in the game. The fact is we get a, a plot point within a game that, we, that we're playing that doesn't ever get finished. You know, it get, never gets resolved. So the game is unfinished, the story's unfinished. At one point, like, mission... 51 or it's like mission 41 or something like that just appears in your in your mission kind of select screen and it's called the man who sold the world and it gets you um to replay the whole 
intro segment of the Phantom Pain. Now, some intro segments to games have you just playing the game. Yeah, you can just interrupt the things, and the way they're done is is you can still you're still in full control of your character, but the, you know there's certain circumstances and things that happen within within those intros. In this, it's a walking simulator. The whole intro of the game is great the first time you witness it. Brilliant, amazing. Uh, when you have to play that over and over and over again, and you have to play that for for this mission, the man who sold the world, I was like ripping my hair out i couldn't take it i didn't want to have to fucking play it and i haven't played the game four times i dread having to do that mission again because it is literally a slow ass fucking walking simulator um it would have been better if i could just sit there and watch it as a cutscene i'll be honest now other things um what they do to huey emmerich's character huey emmerich is a character from um metal gear solid peace walker and also he's mentioned you know by how otacon emmerich um, in the previous Metal Gear games, Metal Gear Solid 2 to be exact. In Peace Walker, you find out Huey was like, he's disabled, he can't walk, um, and he has like a, a wheelchair and stuff like that, and he falls in love with Doctor Strange Love, who's a character from, you know, Peace Walker as well. Um, she's this Russian scientist, and they both fall in love, and they have a child who is Hal Otacon. Now, in Peace Walker, one of the, the best moments of that, that game's plot was how Huey falls in love with with strange love, um, she kisses him, and she says, "If you want to be with me, then you need to, you know, walk. You need to prove that you can get up and walk." And so it inspires Huey to come up with these mechanical legs that we see him use in Phantom Pain. However, his personality changes. That whole plot point and moment within Peace Walker is so good. I love it. Um, but Doctor Strange Love and Huey have a child, Otacon, and Huey goes crazy. He just flips one day. Um, he's working for Skullface. He puts Hal in the the pilot seat of this this huge Metal Gear, you know, Sahelanthropus, I think it's called. Um, and yeah, and then after he does that, Doctor Strange Love finds out, sends Hal off to America to live with some family that are over there or something like that. And um, and Huey ends up killing her. He locks her in the AI pod, you know, the boss's AI pod. She suffocates to death, and that's that. So Huey turns into this maniacal, uncaring, unemotional, unfeeling character overnight. He lies, he's a compulsive liar. Um, he like at one point infects the whole of Mother Base with the parasite, you know, strain and stuff like that. He just turns into a complete douchebag and it's literally like snap of the fingers type of thing. It's not something that he, he had be that had been building up from Peace Walker and you kind of saw like I don't know, like, when you watch Star Wars Episode 1, 2, and 3, you can see, and yes, I'm not saying they're good films, but I'm saying when you watch those, you can see that, you know, um, Anakin Skywalker is slowly turning into Darth Vader. You can see moments where he shows his more evil side, you know? He has just little flashes of it, and then eventually becomes full evil, you know? He kills, like, kids and stuff. And I would have loved to, to see that happen in, in Peace Walker going into Phantom Pain. I would love to say to you that, you know, that is a storyline that runs through both games. But it doesn't. Huey is an underdog. He's a lovable character, like, from Peace Walker. And then just like that, boom, he switches into this um, piece of shit evil character. Now, I will say that the game does do a good job at, at making you hate his character. Um, but I would say that... The voice actor, Christopher Randolph, who's voiced, you know, Otacon as well as Huey, um, he's the one that should be getting the praise because he really does bring life to the character with his voiceover. Next to that, um, they got rid of David Hayter as Snake, and instead we get 24's Kiefer Sutherland barely doing a voiceover for Venom Snake. He says about, I don't know, three lines in the entire game that are of anything of, of worth. Uh, changing from David Hayter was a big mistake. I can see people that are making excuses. Oh, well, it's not actually, you know, um, Solid Snake. It's it's Big Boss. Yeah, well, you know, Big Boss was voiced by David Hayter in Metal Gear Solid 3. And uh, he was voiced by someone completely different as older Big Boss in Metal Gear Solid 4. But that's not why they did it. They just wanted to, to bring in, you know, a more upmarket higher end voice actor and they found Kiefer Sutherland you know to do it so that's why they did that it's got nothing to do with all oh, it was 
because of different characters. No, bullshit. Um, yeah, and then you just have, like, the, the, like, once again, the voice cast, cool. They're good. Robin Atkin Downs is great as Miller, once again, like he was in Peace Walker. But my god, Revolver Ocelot has no personality in this game. And that isn't a fault of Troy Baker voicing him, because we all know that Troy Baker has pulled off some amazing performances uh, within video games. The Last of Us, Uncharted 4, Bioshock Infinite as Booker DeWitt. He's great. But Kojima just thought, oh, why don't we just have Revolver Ocelot in the game as one of Venice Snake's men, basically one of his, his lieutenants. And uh, it says a lot when Master Miller is a more interesting character than Revolver Ocelot. But, you know, a lot of the characterizations in this game are fucking ski whiff. They're screwed up. Same as the story. Um, another thing that the game does is bore you to death about halfway through because you only get two locations to explore. You get Afghanistan and Africa. And I would have thought that being uh, set in Africa for at least some of the duration of the game would have enabled us to see like Frank Yeager and you know whether it be Venom Snake or Big Boss meet up with Sniper Wolf. Just you know kind of explain how Big Boss's legend came to be and how his name spread across uh, the world. We don't get to see any of that. Um, you just have random PMC soldiers that you need to go and spy on and then fall back to your mother base and nothing ever really intrudes into the rest of the, the series lore and that's a bad thing because this is the last game, you know, it's supposed to be the conclusion to the epic uh, saga of, of Metal Gear games. Nothing like that ever happens. And as I've expressed before, you know, characters like Skullface, they're literally just um, just nobodies that they decided to, to make bigger than they, and more important than they actually are within the, the overall canon. And it doesn't explain Big Boss's story because you don't play as Big Boss, you play as Venom Snake. Uh, all you get to see is Big Boss being a, a coward and a bit of a pussy. Uh, he leaves everything to Venom Snake, Master Miller and Revolver Ocelot and then just runs off and tries to create light out of heaven or something. It's, it's rubbish, it's, it's bad story writing, it's um, like I said a kick in the nuts to, to a lot of long time Metal Gear Solid fans. Uh, are there any good things about this game? I like a couple of the, the boss battles, this game doesn't have a lot of boss battles either um, compared to other Metal Gear Solid games, so that's disappointing. But I do like the fight between Venom Snake and the Man on Fire aka Volgan, that's pretty cool. And also like the, the boss battle between Sahelanthropus and Venom Snake. I have to slow down when I say Sahelanthropus because that name is ridiculous to try and say fast. So That's two of the best boss battles within the game. Other than that, you're just uh, treated to a lot of like running back and forth through Afghanistan and, and Africa and it gets extremely tedious. Uh, the helicopter takes ages to pick you up. You do have like these, these enemies called the Skulls who are one of the game's saving graces. They're really cool. I love them. I love the music. That plays when they, they appear and they chase you and stuff and you have to take them on. Other than that, like I said, um, the environments are really detailed and cool to look at, but they're, they're extremely boring, you know? That's the difference when you have outdoor environments to indoor environments. You can do a lot with indoor environments, but if you're going for a specific look and uh, a kind of certain amount of realism, you're going to have to make Africa and Afghanistan look a bit more, well, realistic and photorealistic and, you know, other kind of types of crazy shit can't really be, be happening. Um, I mean, I've talked about this game long enough. It's a game that I, I dislike greatly. And um, yeah, I think that Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain were kind of the start of uh, the decline of the series. But thank God that the series died with this game and didn't continue. There is another one called Metal Gear Survive. It's a zombie camp building game, I think you could call it. A base builder with zombies. It's atrocious it's terrible i'm never gonna play it um and you know I, I guess there is something to be said for metal gear solid phantom pain at least that it kept me coming back at least four times but i think on my fourth playthrough i really did did know that this game wasn't for me and it wasn't what i what i expected from the metal gear solid series and it wasn't what i loved from that series either all in all metal gear solid one two uh, Peace Walker, they're all great. 
Um, that's disregarding Portable Ops and Twin Snakes, because Twin Snakes is an inferior remake to, to the original um, of Metal Gear Solid. Other than those two games, this includes kind of Revengeance. I, I like Metal Gear Solid. Great, great game. Masterpiece, revolutionary. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 2, another fantastic game. You know, knocked, knocked it out of the park with that one. MGS3 is tons of fun. Um, it's goofy, silly, cheesy, but such a, a meaty experience and such a good game as well. It's another masterpiece. You've got 4, which is a flawed game, but still for fans. It is an amazing love letter to fans, I will say that, and it rounds everything off, at least with Solid Snake's, you know, story. Uh, then we have Revengeance, which is a great, fun, hack-and-slash kind of adventure game fe that features Raiden, just so happens to feature Raiden and some some kind of other elements and, and things from the Metal Gear Solid universe. And then we have Peace Walker, which is, um, you know, just a great kind of prequel slash sequel to uh, to you know the rest of the games so overall I think Metal Gear Solid has had a lot more hits than it has uh, misses just because I don't like Phantom Pain and I've shared kind of the reasons why most of this video is me kind of ranting on about Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain but the reason why I'm ranting on is because I'm trying to to fight my corner as to why I don't like it um, I know it has fans and I'm really, the thing is I'm jealous that you guys could find something that I didn't find because I really, after four playthroughs, wanted to like it. I wanted it to be part of that series that I love so much, but I just, it just didn't hit, hit for me and um, I am a bit jealous of people that can, you know, can kind of enjoy it and, and slot it into the, the same canon as the rest of the games and also kind of slot it in you know, with like all the, the, the kind of top tier Metal Gear games. I can't unfortunately and it's a bit of a shame. It's not a good thing, I'm not slagging it off like, ha hey, yeah, you know, it's shit, ha ha ha, I'm not doing that. Like, the fact that I love this series so much, I wanted it to, to, to be really, really good and I'm not slagging it off, I'm just showing why I'm so flipping like, pissed off with it and why I'm, you know, frustrated and upset with the game. Um, so don't take it personal. I do know that it is, you know, there are parts of that game that are great, uh, legendary tier, but there's so few, few and far between that I can't really pick them out. It's more the the bad stuff that comes into my mind every time I think of the game. So, you know, overall, it's it's a flop in my opinion. But Metal Gear Solid all the way to Peace Walker, those games have been fantastic and I've enjoyed every single one of them. I absolutely adore my Legacy Collection, I'm glad that I was able to pick it up. It was kind of pricey, it was about £38 to, to £40, pounds, um, but I am glad that I own it and I've played every single game back to back. Um, except for the first one because I played it on PSP instead. But yeah, I've played them all the way to like Peace Walker and yeah, thoroughly enjoy uh, those games every time I play through them. So all in all, Metal Gear Solid is probably my second favourite series um, and franchise next to the Resident Evil series. And uh, it was my go-to games at the time. There's only two franchises that I'll fully pick up on day one that would have to be really, really fucking bad um, for me not to actually pick them up. And those would be Metal Gear Solid and Resident Evil. Uh, Resident Evil is still, you know... A series that I'll go and pick up day one, but Metal Gear doesn't really exist anymore, and I don't think it ever will. You know, Kojima has left Konami now, and he's gone, and that's that. You know what I mean? Um, I know that a lot of people might say, "Yeah, but he he's the one that made Phantom Pain," but I still think that Phantom Pain was a completely kind of different game. It was his own thing to start with, um, and I do feel like he was. I don't know, there's certain things that he did with the game that I think he was he was trying to piss off Konami. He was fed up of making Metal Gear games, let's be honest. He wanted to make something completely new, and when you see what Death Stranding's about, and, and kind of like, uh, what that game's like, you can see that, apart from kind of like the open world sort of style and setting that mirrors Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain a little bit, it's a completely brand new idea and concept. So he was a bit bored of making Metal Gear Solid games, but I do like that we have, you know, a couple of games that are really, really good. Same with the Resident Evil series. Um, and that at least if Konami try and milk it, you know, ever if they ever want to milk it again, at least we'll always have those original kind of games and stuff to go back to. So Metal Gear Solid is one of my favorite all-time series next to Resident Evil. 
and um, it always will be and it will live on through generations and generations now all I want them to do is if they they can and they actually show some some interest and some love is remake the first game or at least remake the original so Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 uh, Solid Snake that would be great but I'm not gonna hold my breath uh, Konami are as we've seen our souls they're really fucking bad uh, as a company and they treat their staff like shit um, and to be honest I'd like to just see them disappear much like EA and, and Ubisoft but you know it is what it is um, I don't think we'll ever get any remakes of the old 8-bit Metal Gear Solid games but we can hope um, no one else is gonna make them other than Konami because they own the rights so anyway I've gone on long enough um, I hope you enjoyed my my why I love Metal Gear Solid so much podcast uh, I showered tons of praise to each and every game except for maybe Phantom Pain but I've shared at least my reasons for why I don't you know vibe with that game and I don't like it that much um, if you like the, the podcast go ahead hit like uh, if you want to keep updated with any content that I put out in the future hit subscribe and until next time I've been John from Guinness Games and once again I'm signing out